I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Scott Irwin, and my partner Daryl Good and I, we're going to be uh, presenting a webinar this morning on updated supply, demand, and price prospects for corn and soybeans. We welcome you. Uh, first, a couple of administrative items. Uh, the PDF uh, file of the slides for today's webinar uh, are available at the uh, FarmDoc site that's listed above. Uh, even more conveniently, uh, for those of you that are tuning in this morning, on your right-hand side of your screen, you should see a place where it says handouts, and you can just click there, and you'll get uh, get the slides. Uh, the complete video uh, for this webinar uh, will be available sometime tomorrow, so that will include this presentation as well as the Q&A that uh, we're going to do after about 30 minutes of presentation. Uh, finally, uh, remember to submit your questions during our presentation. Again, we're going to uh, talk for about 30 minutes, and we plan on having 30 minutes of Q&A time uh, if we have enough questions. Uh, so you can submit your questions during the first half of the uh, show or you can do it uh, as we're answering other questions. So get those questions uh, coming in. All right, we want to get started. Uh, Friday was a big day. Uh, that's when the U.S. Department of Agriculture issued their first what we call survey-based estimate of yield. Always good to reinforce that previous to August for corn and soybeans, they're essentially a version of trend, not based on um, any kind of formal survey. August is when the big survey procedures uh, are used. And the USDA yield uh, for U.S. average for corn came in at 175.1 bushels per acre. Uh, that was obviously a big number. Uh, the average uh, trade guess before the report, uh, the measurement that we saw was 170.6. So you can see that's a, over a four bushel a difference between what was expected and what the USDA put out there, which was a new national uh, record by a considerable amount. So uh, standing here in August, the USDA uh, has has an expectation of very large corn yields for 2016. Try to put that into some perspective, uh, even though that is a really big number in absolute terms, 175.1. Uh, this chart uh, can puts that yield on what I call an apples-to-apples -apples basis by uh, subtracting the trend yield from each yield over 1960 through 2016 and then ranking those from high to low and here just showing the top 20 positive trend deviations uh, the blue are actual final yields where the red bar for 2016 is the yield deviation for uh, the August 1 USDA uh, estimate in 2016. So. Uh, with that as background, uh, we can see that the trend deviation forecast by the USDA this year is 10.9 bushels. So it's clearly a very, very good uh, yield, uh, being almost 11 bushels above trend. But it's a little arguable whether that's truly a monster yield or not, because uh, it only represents the eighth largest trend deviation uh, a positive trend deviation uh, since 1960. Uh, definitely solidly in the top 10, but not actually even in the top five. Um, you can look at that two ways. It is a, a, a very good yield, uh, but it says that uh, lurking out there uh, at some point in a future year is another 2009, 94, 2004 even, uh, where you get something closer to 14 to 15 bushels above trend. Uh, so that's one way of keeping uh, the yield in perspective. There were, as it turns out, nine states, as this chart shows, that had new record yields. The uh, 
little pound sign uh, or hashtag says that there's a new record in those states and you can see that uh, many of those were coming uh, in the heart of the Corn Belt. We see Kentucky, Illinois, and Iowa and Nebraska all having new record yields. Uh, the really monster side, Daryl, of the report uh, really came in on the production side because with that very good yield and the large acreage that we had, uh, U.S. Uh, corn production was estimated by the USDA to be uh, 15.153 billion bushels. And we can see that was uh, considerably above the average guess of just a little under 14.8 billion bushels, uh, giving us by a pretty healthy margin a uh, new record uh, for U.S. corn production for 2016-17. Uh, looking at that surprise part of the report on the production side, I really like this chart. I think it really puts the report into perspective because we're not just looking at yield, we're looking at total production. And total production was 396 million bushels more than at least that measured market expectation uh, going into the report. Uh, that is the largest in absolute value uh, surprise uh, going back into the mid-90s. Uh, it was the largest of the positives and the negatives. So that, that was a pretty major shock delivered uh, to the market in terms of the expected size of the U.S. corn crop in 2016. Of course, uh, and there's a lot of chatter in the market about this very question. There is, uh, it's important to remember just how much variability in USDA estimates is typical after August. This ch chart shows the final U.S. corn yield estimate minus the August forecast and we can see that that varies considerably, uh, you know, all the way from minus 12 to plus 12 literally and a typical variation uh, would be plus or minus four or five bushels from August to the final. Of course what we all would really want to be able to do is to uh, predict the direction and the magnitude of subsequent changes and I suspect that we'll have several questions along those lines. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl. Okay, the, this slide also indicates, Scott, that uh, we still have some uncertainty about acreage on corn as well as yield. We just repeated a slide we used in our previous webinar to show that uh, the current production forecast is based on the June survey of acreage, and uh, there there may be some change in that when the USDA finalizes in in August, but I just wanted to point out that FSA released its first monthly report of acreage being reported under the farm programs and just without elaborating on that too much to say there's nothing in that report that would suggest that that NAS will will change their current corn yield or corn acreage number very much when when we get into October and, and beyond. Uh, I did want to also talk just a bit about the old crop situation on corn because uh, not only is crop size important for the upcoming balance sheet for 2016-17, uh, the magnitude of beginning stocks is also uh, uh, important at the margin. And the, so the question is whether uh, corn use during the current marketing year uh, is going to reach the USDA forecast. Uh, this chart just looks at ethanol use by month so far this marketing year and what we see is that uh, use in recent months has dropped below that of last year while to reach the USDA's forecast of 5.2 billion bushels use in July and August uh, needs to be um, measurably larger than what it was last year. Uh, given the increased efficiency we that's being reported on ethanol production and sorghum use I think there's still some lingering doubt that we can reach 5.2 billion bushels of corn use for ethanol this marketing year. 
The other category of use is exports. Uh, USDA did raise their projection for the current year to 1.925 billion. Uh, we've we've exported just over 1.7 to date, uh, with just less than four weeks left. Uh, we, we need to ship about 57.6 million bushels per week. We have enough sales to do that, 305 million bushels of outstanding sales, and we've recently been shipping at a very rapid pace, 53 million bushels over the last couple months. So we, we need that pace to be maintained, but at this juncture, it, it looks like USDA may be close, um, maybe just a smidgen high on the export projection as well. Finally, uh, the big unknown on, on old crop corn use is fourth quarter feed and residual use. USDA left their projection at 5.2 billion bushels. To reach that summer use, fourth quarter use needs to be only uh, so about 650 million bushels. Uh, that looks really high compared to where we have been. Uh, again, with the expectation of increased wheat feeding, we judge that uh, it's going to be a stretch perhaps to reach the 5.2. So all of this to say directionally, uh, we think that beginning stocks of corn could be a bit larger than what the current USDA balance sheet shows uh, because of uh, some shortfall in ethanol and probably feed use of corn. But having said that, even when we get more data over the next four weeks and we figure we know what use was during the marketing year, uh, history shows us that there can be a surprise in the September stocks number. So while folks, including ourselves, will continue to refine our projection of beginning stocks, uh, we won't really know that number until September 30th when USDA releases their numbers. So. Taking all that, uh, then we just go to our balance sheet here, as we've done in the past. The first column shows uh, last Friday's USDA projected balance sheet for the upcoming marketing year, and the second column would be our tweaks in terms of uh, expectations relative to that baseline projection. Uh, I think the numbers speak for themselves. I don't need to talk about each one individually, but uh, the important ones are we we, uh, we are using a slightly lower yield forecast than USDA's 175. Uh, again, uh, taking into consideration some of the discussion that's been uh, going on about plant populations, ear weights, uh, and so on, it, it just seems that uh, the 175 is a bit of a stretch based on what we know at this point. So. We're fading that using still a record yield number of 173. Again, as I said, uh, that would give us a slightly smaller crop, uh, about 180 million bushels smaller. Uh, we, we do offset that a bit with larger beginning stocks, not much, 50 million. But again, I think the important here is the direction of that. We, we think stocks will be a bit larger than the 1.7 USDA is using. Uh, we get a slightly lower total supply number, obviously. Uh, we're also fading uh, USDA's feed and residual number for the coming year. It looks awfully big, even though prices are low and residual use could be quite large. Uh, if the current year's number is overestimated, uh, it may imply that next year's number is a little high as well. So we don't take it down much, but in we think directionally uh, it'll be a little bit lower than USDA. Ethanol use, in, in contrast, we think could be a bit higher. Um, increased gasoline consumption, reduced sorghum use as a feedstock, I think will support corn consumption at a higher level next year. Uh, we also fade exports just a bit, uh, thinking that last half of the marketing year could see considerably more competition from South American production than was the case this year. So while we will start the year with a rapid pace of exports, uh, we, we think it could weaken seasonally in the last half of the year. Uh, the balance sheet then in terms of consumption and ending stocks doesn't differ a lot from USDA. Ending stocks as a percent of consumption is only a half a point difference. Uh, but where we do differ is on the average price projection. Uh, we're, we're still at a, at $3.40 as an average 
cash farm price uh, for the upcoming marketing year uh, 25 cents higher than USDA. Uh, we we use this uh, stocks to use model that we've talked about before, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just to say that uh, we've estimated this relationship between uh, ending stocks as a percent of use and the average farm price for the marketing year, and we're still looking at a weak demand scenario. So if we plug our projected ending stocks of 16% into that equation, uh, we get a 340 average farm price, and that's kind of what we're sticking with at this point. Now, what that implies, of course, is that there's room for cash corn prices to increase from where we are now. If we are to average 340, uh, that's well above uh, new crop bids at this point. Uh, to me, it implies uh, kind of a seasonal pattern of corn prices that we see cash prices lowest near harvest time, uh, slightly bef before or slightly after the peak of harvest, but in that harvest window. And then it speaks to kind of a gradual price recovery as we go through the marketing year. Now, where will that recovery come from? One thing we've noticed and others have talked about is in many markets, uh, the current new crop basis is quite strong on corn. Uh, this compares uh, Thursday bids in the central Illinois uh, harvest bid versus December futures, and we're currently at a, about 25 under uh, fu December futures as of last Thursday. Uh, that's about a nickel stronger than we were at this time last year. So with a huge crop coming on, we are experiencing a pretty strong basis. I think that speaks to uh, demand strength, particularly in the export market, is supporting new crop cash bids at this point. When we look at the carry in the futures market, uh, December uh, trading settled uh, Friday at 3.33, July at 3.57. Uh, we have a 24 cent carry in the market. Uh, that That's, in our opinion, uh, a bit small compared to expectations that you might have with such a huge crop that needs to be stored this year. In my opinion, uh, I think some of the lack of carry reflects expectations that South American production will rebound next year, uh, putting some pressure on those deferred uh, futures prices. Bottom line is that if we are to get uh, an increase in, in cash prices as we go through the year, uh, less than the normal part of that increase probably will come in the form of basis appreciation. Uh, we don't have the really hugely weak bases. We don't have the big carry. It does suggest that uh, compared to other big crop years, that more of the seasonal price increase would probably come in the futures market rather than the cash market. So with that, uh, we'll move on to soybeans. All right, soybeans, uh, more of the big crop story. Um, this chart shows the history of U.S. soybean yields going back to 1960. Uh, we can see the sharp upward trend over time, and the USDA on Friday projected 2016 soybean yields at 48.9 bushels per acre, uh, another a new record on the soybean side uh, compared to the average guess of 47.5, so we see a 1.4 bushel positive surprise. So that was also a very good uh, yield by historical standards. Just how good? We can use the same kind of chart that we looked at uh, for soybeans, uh, for corn, for soybeans, showing the um, top 20 positive trend deviations, again, where the blue bars represent actual deviations from trend, and the red bar for 2016 represents the uh, projected deviation from trend based on that uh, USDA August 1st estimate released on Friday. And that number was 3.9 bushels per acre, uh, which uh, is uh, clearly in what I would call the monster category of yields, uh, only exceeded by 1994's 5.4 bushels per acre. So that is a very, very healthy U.S. Uh, average soybean yield. 
some perspectives really interesting. Um, notice of the top five trend yield deviations, three of them have occurred uh, in the last three years. 14, 15, and 16 have uh, all been uh, extremely good soybean yields, which raises the interesting question, is that just a clustering of really good weather for soybean production? Or does it mean that something is going on with the uh, yield technology and production technology for soybeans that's giving us a jump in trend yields? Don't hear a lot of discussion about that, but uh, that is a very interesting uh, clustering of such good yields. and. It will just simply take more data before we can disentangle the weather versus technology uh, input into explaining those really good soybean yields. One more point on this chart um, is it's interesting to ask ourselves whether we think a 2016 soybean yields uh, will really be uh, six tenths of a bushel more above trend than 2014, which in particular was a very good soybean growing year, or even half a bushel better than 2015. Uh, maybe that'll turn out to be the case, uh, but I think that's maybe part of uh, the caution that you're seeing in the market uh, moving forward in terms of interpreting these uh, soybean yields. Looking at the soybean yield by state, uh, the uh, states in blue uh, are increases over uh, 2015, red are declines, uh, and we can see in particular new records in the heart of the Corn Belt in Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois and Missouri. Uh, some really, really big uh, yields are being reported. Uh, are estimated uh, Nebraska at 59, Iowa at 57, and Illinois at 57 bushels per acre. And so those are basically uh, much of what's powering that 48.9 uh, 48 uh, bushel record projection for yield in 2016. Uh, like uh, corn, uh, the total production uh, for soybeans estimated by the USDA uh, for August 1st is a new record of 4.06 billion bushels, which was again well above the average guess going into the report of 3.941 billion bushels. And we can put that into uh, more precise terms, that was 119 million bushel positive surprise going back uh, comparisons to the mid-90s. Um, that certainly would be classified as a very large surprise. It was only exceeded by the positive surprise last year. Uh, and uh, so again, a very large uh, a production surprise that the market had to absorb uh, on Friday. Here's the history going back into the mid-90s of the final U.S. soybean yield estimate minus the August forecast. Um, and we can see that uh, there can be some fairly large revisions on soybeans as well. The extreme, extremes are minus 6 to plus 4.6 bushel changes uh, with a bit more frequency of the up than the downs. Uh, but overall, you'd have to say that a plus or minus 2 bushel swing from August in either direction um, is not unusual uh, moving forward. So we'll have a lot of discussion, I'm sure, uh, even today in the Q&A. Going forward in the next month or so, where that direction is likely to go as we finish up the current 2016 growing season. Turn it back to Daryl. Yeah. Hey Scott, <clears throat> again on the on the estimating the size of this year's crop acreage will still be of some importance. Uh, this chart shows that uh, the USDA's June acreage forecast is not always the final estimate. In fact, it rarely is. 
we've had some big deviations, uh, mostly in years when we've had a lot of prevent plant, uh, like 2015. Uh, the FSA data released on Friday, uh, again, to me says that uh, it doesn't really conflict with the current NAS estimate of planted acres, and uh, I see no reason that there will be a significant change in, in the acreage estimate as we go forward. Uh, on old crop, again, getting at the question of how big will beginning stocks be for the upcoming marketing year, uh, just looking at exports and then crush, uh, USDA raised their export projection by 85 million bushels in this report. I don't ever recall that happening before in this late in the year. Uh, they had to do that because we already shipped 1.8, which was above last month's forecast. We have outstanding sales of 200 million bushels uh, to reach the 1.88 billion. We need to ship 21 million bushels per week. In the last three or four weeks, we've been averaging 29 million bushels a week. So it appears we've got enough sales. We're shipping fast enough. We should, in fact, reach the 1880 as, a, as exports for the year. On crush, uh, I looked at monthly crush just for May, June of this year so far because uh, the USDA report of crush was not available before May of 2015, but you can see that this year crush, monthly crush in May and June was running well ahead of last year, and to reach the USDA's projection of 1.9 billion, uh, we kind of need to maintain that margin in July and August. Uh, the uh, National Oilseed Processors Association will release their estimate of of the July crush later this morning, and it's anticipated it will continue to show that margin year over year. So on both exports and crush, uh, I don't see any reason to doubt the USDA's projections at this point, which means that, yes, we could see a surprise in the September 1 stocks number, as we often do, uh, but current consumption numbers uh, are consistent with what USDA is projecting, and, and we will use of their carryout number as the beginning stocks for next year. Where we deviate for soybeans is basically the same where we deviate on corn. Uh, we are fading the yield number just a bit. Uh, we're putting in 48 bushels, which would equal last year's record. Uh, thinking that uh, 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 conditions don't really quite support 48.9 at this point uh, would give us a slightly smaller crop, slightly smaller supply. Uh, again, we're fading the export projection just a bit, thinking that uh, competition could be much more significant in the last half of the marketing year. Uh, gives us a smaller ending stocks on soybeans, 269, 6.7% stocks to use ratio and an average farm price of, of $9.50, which would be $0.40 cents above uh, the USDA projection. But as with corn, the nine fifty is within the range of the USDA's projected average marketing price. Our, our numbers would be kind of at the upper end of the range rather than the midpoint, uh, which is what uh, we're showing here for USDA. So as with uh, corn, uh, that price would suggest that uh, there is room for soybean prices to remain pretty strong. Uh, we haven't seen really the weakness yet in soybean prices relative to the corn. Uh, they've been maintained at a little stronger level, primarily, I think, because of the strong export demand. But even when we look at new crop, uh, we're seeing a pretty strong basis in, in central Illinois. I know it varies a lot regionally. Uh, but we're running uh, a full, looks like 10 cents stronger on new crop bases than we were last year. Uh, I think, again, that speaks to the strong nearby demand for soybeans. Uh, unlike corn, which shows a modest carry, uh, the soybean market is inverted. Uh, as we go forward, we see steady to slightly lower futures prices. Uh, the market is saying that there's really not much return to storage. In fact, no return to storage at this point with a pretty strong harvest basis, lack of carry in the futures, 
um, this, that, that carry really will not cover much in the way of storage cost. So one thing the current market is saying is that uh, the, the cheapest way to own soybeans at this point is, is probably not in the cash market. Uh, the cheapest way is, is probably with derivatives, either futures or options at this point, uh, basis contracts, uh, moving ownership out of the cash market. Uh, but the price structure also suggests that a pretty flat cash price projection for the year, that seasonally uh, we're, our expectation is for a fairly strong rebound in cash prices as we move forward. Uh, we would expect a, a, a flatter price pattern on soybeans uh, going forward, uh, getting to, getting us to that nine and a half dollar average cash price for the year. So uh, I'm going to stop there. I think we've about used our 30 minutes. Um, we still invite questions, and uh, we do have a number of questions at this point. Many of them dealing with the methodology for the USDA yield forecasts, uh, ear counts, uh, the role of the farmer survey, uh, and those type of things. So maybe just a brief summary of how the USDA conducts and reaches its uh, August yield forecast would be in order. Um, have Scott do that real quickly. Oh, okay. I guess. <laughs> sure. Well, just some basic facts. I'm, I don't want to go too uh, much into the weeds of the details, but uh, the kind of things that Daryl and I have emphasized over the years. First is that the USDA uses two different yield indicators based on two different, entirely different survey um, procedures. The easiest one to understand is what they call their farm operator survey. Uh, that is simply uh, a uh, computer-assisted telephone or internet uh, poll, if you will, of farmers across the country about their corn yields. It's very, very simple. Uh, farmers are surveyed and asked, what do you think your corn yields will be this year? And farmers answer. And then the USDA tabulates those results. Uh, nothing very complicated about that. The, it's interesting, that's uh, one half of the two uh, surveys uh, typically doesn't get much attention, Daryl, is what yeah. Daryl, we found over the years. It's kind of like that half of the USDA gets forgotten, uh, but it's half. The other half is what is called the objective yield survey, and that's where the USDA sends um, enumerators into the fields uh, in major producing states, seven states right now, right, Darrell? I think 10. Is it 10? Yeah. 10. 10 states right now for corn. Uh, soybeans are not exactly always the same number. And uh, that's where they take uh, measurements for, uh, typically I think it's a 17 and a half uh, foot uh, uh, sample, and so they'll count the population, they'll count the stocks of corn that have an ear, and when the crop is mature enough, they will measure uh, the weights, and then those can be um, used to project yields uh, in, uh, in that area. So that's the key, is that the USDA uses two different uh, yield indicators, and our understanding is when they're all done uh, gathering the data from these two different survey sources that they essentially uh, do an equally weighted average of the yield. So if they've got a yield for uh, nationally for the farmers and a yield nationally for the uh, uh, from the objective yield, they just average the two. So whenever you see a released published number, uh, it's essentially a average from these two different surveys. And that that is a kind of a starting point. I don't know in terms of details what you want to add, Daryl, but that's that that's a key thing that to, to keep in mind in understanding uh, what the USDA publishes. Then I think then the, the main issue is then how is that data used when the USDA reports plant population or ear population in this case and average ear weight and the estimate of plant or ear population is based on counts in those 10 objective yield states. So they're looking at maybe 1,100 plots 
in 10 states counting plant population and that's what they report. They're not asking farmers any information about plant population. Then in terms of ear weight, in the objective yield survey, the USDA, where there is enough maturity, the USDA can estimate uh, ear weights in those objective yield plots. In most cases, in August, there's not enough maturity to actually weigh ears, and so what they tend to do is use uh, at previous year averages, uh, typically a five-year average ear weight is used. So this is the tricky part in, uh, that people have a hard time understanding because there's some circularity here. A USDA, in the objective part of the yield estimate, either measures or estimates ear weight. Uh, and uh, so it's part of their yield forecast. In the farmer survey, they're asked just what do you expect the yield to be. Then when you get the two yield estimates and you take the average, then you can use the USDA's measured plant population in, in the objective yield survey uh, and the average yield forecast of the two surveys, and you calculate an implied ear weight. Uh, so there can be errors in that estimate of ear weight from two sources. One, the USDA's estimate of ear weight based on five-year averages may not reflect what is actually happening this year. But secondly, and perhaps under-recognized, is that, that farmers, if they have overestimated yield, um, results in an in a implied ear weight that's too high. And so you have two sources of potential error, and that's why I really dislike uh, the the use of the implied ear weight at this point in the in the survey process it's a, it's partially a measured number partially a derived number and I think people tend to read way too much into it this time of year that's right well I just had a commentary on that ear weight uh, issue the the final implied ear weight and population is probably a reasonable estimate yeah. Because when that's computed with the final survey in December, farmers are generally harvested all the crop. Um, and so in some sense, there should be a convergence between both the farmer side and the objective yield numbers. Um, I think the ear counts per acre are probably more stable than the ear weights. And so the, the final numbers... Um, uh, when you look at that ear weight versus uh, ear count per acre are, are probably a reasonable numbers even though it's kind of a funny way to impute it. The problem comes when uh, you look at that kind of number uh, in August when it's so heavily influenced by farmers uh, implied assumption from their yield number about that weight and we know Keep in mind that if the USDA's ear counts are relatively stable, and that's what we know, we haven't looked at that directly from August through uh, January, uh, but we wouldn't think those would change very much uh, through the season, that the ear weight has to change basically proportionately with the changing yield expectation. So you, you really can't eliminate uncertainty by looking at the ear weight. So probably enough on that. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to address that in, in a Farm Doc Daily article that will be published on Wednesday. Uh, we'll try not to confuse the issue, but to <laughs> illuminate a little bit on the methodology in that. Just responding quickly to a couple of questions here, uh, I saw one earlier about uh, whether the FSA acreage data released on Friday implies that NAS will perhaps raise its acreage estimate. Uh, as I indicated, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, oh, I think what has happened this year is it uh, looks like farmers reporting to FSA is occurring early this year. The pace at which FSA gets to its final acreage number from August to January varies tremendously from year to year. Um, and the only thing that really matters is uh, what's the ratio at the end of the s s uh, season 
how does FSA acreage compare to NAS numbers? And I think what this year is is that FSA is getting uh, reports in early. They're getting to their final number much earlier than in normal years. So I, I don't want to read too much at the end of that August report at this point. All right, I'm going to take the question. Record corn yields seem improbable given NASA's lower plant population than 14 and 15. How do you reconcile it? Well, the arithmetic is simple. It's exactly what we were talking about. Um, record high ear weights uh, um, are, are implicit on the farmer side. Uh, we don't know exactly what the USDA assumed on the objective year side, but that's how you get to the um, to that large uh, number. Um, and it, it certainly was a new record uh, yield and new record uh, production number. There was a question on that. Um, the the question is uh, about both yield and ear weights. Uh, we're again, as we indicated not quite as optimistic as the August uh, report would indicate. You saw in our balance sheets, we faded the USDA 175.1 by two bushels an acre. Um, that, that's, that's fairly substantial. One thing I'm persuaded by uh, in, in doing that is um, we've had very good rains this summer. Uh, much of the Midwest has been in that sweet spot of uh, four to six inches of July precipitation, getting very good precipitation again in August, even though that's not as good for corn. Uh, so the rainfall has been very, very good. Uh, but typically to get into those monster trend deviation uh, figures, you need to have cool temps in, August, in July and August. And while we haven't had super hot weather, we've been a little bit above average. So uh, it, it just seems us a little bit un illogical to forecast quite as uh, large a number as the USDA came out, given that we had plenty of rainfall, but we haven't seen those really cool temps that typically lengthen the grain filling period and give you those huge yields. Because right now, the USDA is forecasting a larger um, trend deviation for 2016 than, say, even in 2014, uh, final yield, uh, which and most people would think that the growing conditions were even better in 2016. But there's always a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, and in 2014, we did find that, I mean, USDA's yield forecast on corn did peak at 174 before right. it finally came down to 171 as the final estimate. So the question has been, has the August yield forecast ever been the highest of the season? Uh, and and okay. the answer is yes, it has been. And I think 2010 was probably a year when I, that I can remember a lot higher. The, when the August forecast was the highest of the year by quite a bit. In some earlier drought years, I can remember the August forecast was the highest of the season. So it wouldn't be uh, uncommon for that to happen historically. Uh, then the question is, does the recent flooding in Louisiana and surrounding areas, heavy rain in the Midwest, is that going to affect yield potential? Um, yeah, I need an agronomist here, I guess, to talk about that <laughs> a bit. But uh, my guess is that on a national average basis, it, it will not have a measurable impact on the average yield. Yeah, I'd be there as well. A question came up, uh, is your derivation deviation from trend within the data set or do you run the 30-year trend prior to the individual year in question? They asked this about the, I believe, the trend, the way I calculate trend uh, deviations. Daryl's flipping back to that for me. Uh, the way I did that calculation was I computed the trend from 1960 through 2015 uh, for every year. Uh, of the trend, and then that from that 2000, 1960 through 2015, I computed the trend deviations and then uh, assumed that exact same trend going forward to 2016, and then uh, just computed the trend deviation. Um, I believe that I was using an unconditional trend of 164.2 for 2016 for corn can't remember the number for, I think, 45 bushels for soybeans, and 
then subtract that from the USDA estimate, and that's how I got those numbers. A uh, question about corn demand, uh, the strength in demand. I think currently it's it's primarily in the export market is where we're seeing uh, the demand strength uh, with uh, a rapid pace of actual shipments and fairly large new crop sales at this point, uh, pointing to awfully good demand for this next six months. Uh, the average national farm price that we use in our balance sheet is, is the same that is used for calculating government payments, right. particularly the ARC County payments. So I'll have to tackle why are yields so big? We need another agronomist in here, Daryl. Uh, so uh, is it just good weather or is it a compounding of growth traits coming through? It's a question we often get. Uh, basically, is it uh, genetics or is it weather? And uh, the answer is that it's both, but probably not in the way most people think. Um, it's genetics because the long-term uh, trend is about uh, in increases corn yields in the U.S. on average about 1.8 bushels per year. So roughly that means if you look back uh, over five years that we're going to see um, about a nine bushel increase in yields on average simply from technology. And so we do, you know, we don't see any reason not to project that bump this year, even though um, there are obvious profit and uh, input pressures. But if you look at it, those, those trends in the long run are very, very steady. Um, but the big yields are largely due to uh, very good uh, precipitation and as we indicated, um, and uh, not having uh, hot temperatures. Um, certainly not having cool temperatures, basically close to average. Uh, a question about storage issues with a large crop. Um, clearly, we do have some history with that. We know there will be storage issues. It will vary geographically depending on the relative size of the crop versus storage capacity. Uh, the market, I think, has learned to manage that fairly well. It should be well anticipated this year, and uh, we've, we've made good use of temporary storage facilities to manage big crops. Uh, the other thing that will help at the margin, I, th I think, is is the pace at which we're consuming corn is, is very rapid right now. Uh, we're shipping 50 million a week in the export market, uh, plus a uh, record level of uh, ethanol production and increased feed use, uh, the corn crop will kind of disappear at a fairly rapid rate. So the pace of harvest, as always, will be the key to what kind of storage uh, problems we have in terms of handling the crop, but it, it will get done. <laughs> Question came in, have you looked at the correlation between the level of surprise in the August USDA numbers and the difference between the USDA estimates and the August forecast? I believe we have done that in the past at some point. I can't pull the comparison out of my head, uh, but uh, when we have looked at it, I don't recall there ever having been a relationship that we could uh, could use, Daryl. Yeah, any, any? I think that's right. Yeah. But it's a good thing to check. Let's see, another USDA report. USDA needs to analyze the results of the crop production report. It seems the USDA reports now can be described as surprise and awe, I like that term. With all the information available, it seems they should be doing better. Uh, that's an interesting point with all of the technology. Uh, well, first off, we don't know that they've done badly. They may be spot on this year. Uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, so I wouldn't assume that they're wrong yet. Uh, and that's why, you know, we're not willing to fade them very much. Um, our, Daryl and I have done a lot of research over the years and showing that, uh, that their forecasts generally are unbiased and do about as well as you, you can do. Um, th their estimates uh, year in and year out uh, are we think, given the resources devoted, uh, about as good as you can do. Yeah. Anything you add to that little mini editorial, Daryl? No, I think that pretty well captures it. 
Uh, some questions about the, the corn soybean price ratio and whether that will finally lead to more soybean plantings next year. Uh, our forecasts do show for the upcoming marketing year a relatively high soybean price relative to corn. Uh, theoretically, the planting decision as we go into next spring will be, be based on new crop prices rather than old crop prices, but I think there is some uh, need for the market to incentivize uh, more soybean acres at the expense of corn right. next year and uh, not quite sure what kind of ratio it takes to to move acreage uh, a significant amount but I, I think they're going to have to kind of just consistently be faced with uh, more profitable soybean prices rel relative to corn in order to shift those acres. Right. I see another USDA question came up. How is the USDA me method different for the next report, September, as in do they still use the same two methods in average? Uh, the answer is they use exactly the same methodology um, in that they'll have the farmer operator survey and the objective yield uh, survey. Now when you get to September, on the objective yield side, they have more to measure because the crops are more mature, but the pr the methodology is unchanging. And in fact, um, uh, they go back and resurvey the same farmers. Once they've selected their sample of farm operators to survey for a given year uh, for the August survey, they go back and survey the same farmers in September, October, and November. Uh, before they do their final. Uh, so the methodology is the same. I have a question about given good crop conditions, is there expectation that harvested acres could be bigger than expected? That I guess the question is, could the difference between planted and harvested be smaller mm -hmm. than is normally the case? Uh, I would say two things. Uh, USDA is already forecasting a relatively small difference, particularly on soybeans. Uh, at the lower end of the historic range. On corn, most of the difference is in uh, acreage harvested for silage. That is a pretty constant number from year to year. Uh, so while we will have less probably abandoned acres this year, I think the difference between planted acres of corn and harvested for grain uh, probably is pretty well captured in, in the current USDA estimates. Mm -hmm. A uh, technical question came in uh, on the uh, yield trend deviations. It seems to be generating an unusual number of questions, Daryl. Uh, why don't you use percentage deviation from trend instead of the absolute bushels from trend? Excellent question. Always one of my favorites. Basically, that's uh, an, an empirical observation that um, uh, if you just simply look at the data, um, a simple linear regression for the long run um, with bushel deviations seems to us to be more consistent uh, with the data. If you believed that uh, percentage deviations and a percentage trend uh, yield increase from year to year, if that's the correct model, then you should actually be seeing um, expanding bushel deviations uh, through time. If, you know, you can ask yourself, are the bushel deviations stable or is it the percentage deviations? And they imply different different things. And we, we don't see bushel deviations um, decreasing or increasing over time. So we think the simplest model uh, works the best and that's that's why we focus on bushel deviations rather than percent deviations even though I know a lot of people uh, do favor the percentages. So we do have a question about uh, the way I interpret the question is how quickly will we get a, a more accurate estimate of ear weights? Uh, I think the answer will relies in how quickly this crop matures and how quickly we harvest the crop. Uh, the more quickly it matures uh, in September and October, uh, USDA's objective yield will have an accurate measure of ear weights and as combines roll, farmers will have a better idea of actual yields. 
so that uh, the implied ear weight will will rapidly ap approach actual ear weights. Uh, so uh, it's really uh, probably certainly by the October report uh, we, we should have a pretty good handle on actual ear weights and, and production. Here's a question looking forward into the spring. What leading indicators do you follow to figure out when corn farmers will finally shift plantings toward beans and firm the corn market? Uh, you know, I know uh, people try to uh, get that from uh, maybe uh, private data on seed sales, um, also on input application. You know, those are the kind of anecdotal uh, data early in the fall uh, that that people will start looking at and then people will be doing uh, surveys um, private surveys um, in the next winter the USDA will have their Ag Outlook estimates coming in next February uh, but uh, the economic incentives are basically what I think Daryl and I look at first and foremost and as the people have pointed out here that's a pretty high price ratio right now and as long as that holds up uh, I think we would look for a fairly uh, significant uh, shift in corn, ac corn acreage to, to beans next year what kind of just off the top of our heads what 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 kind of range might we be looking at if these incentives hold up next year yeah, it's really hard hard to say. I, I don't I don't think there's a good way to quantify that. And the thing that's always lurking in the background in my mind is what's happening in South America. I mean, we still have a question of uh, what would we do with more soybean acreage if if South America has is online for a, a huge crop in 2017. So I think the dilemma we have right now is given the, our stock levels and projected stock levels. It appears we need less corn and less wheat acres, but I'm not sure we need more soybean acres <laughs> in the year ahead. So I think the market has a real dilemma in terms of what what uh, incentives what to provide to farmers next year. Uh, it seems like the incentive needs to be for fewer acres in total, which implies that the market needs to be reflecting pretty low prices to do that, and then is there truly an acreage response to low prices and, and how, how strong is that response? So uh, I think we try to make the question more simple than it really is sometimes. It's, it's a pretty dynamic environment in trying to get the right mix of acreage going forward. Right. I, we saw earlier that question on uh, basically have you done any work on storage uh, for this size of crop uh, first off the crop will all get stored it's just a question of uh, where and at what cost um, and storage issues in the grain markets right now are very interesting because we are seeing uh, in the wheat markets uh, the futures markets stuck at full carry uh, problems in convergence in the Kansas City uh, wheat contract and certainly keeping an eye on corn with such a large uh, production estimate and possibly very large inventories at the begin, beginning of the uh, marketing year that one might think that uh, the spreads could have been uh, pushed to full carry but it doesn't seem any evidence yet if it's not going to happen in the next couple a few days after the USDA shock that we've received I, I kind of doubt that that's going to happen in the corn market and soybeans probably we never would have given you know the big inverses that that were were showing uh, so it's an interesting situation wheat stuck at full carry huge corn crop yet um, and when we tend to look at uh, the carry in the futures we use the trade term as percent of full carry and we're looking at those uh, depending what you look at around 50 or 60 percent of full carry in the uh, uh, in the corn market, which is, I think, is very interesting given the size of the crop that we're, um, just speaks to the relatively good demand. My gosh, an hour goes by fast, yeah. Daryl. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to everybody's uh, questions. Uh, one last one you want to want to want to pick up, Daryl? Uh, we still have several. I, I think probably I apologize we can't get to those. Would 
probably ought to just cut it off here at, at this point. We've used our time and we appreciate your participation in our program. Uh, I encourage you to go to the website, download the slides, and sometime tomorrow I would have a video of the presentation as well. Thank you very much, and we're signing off.